Father, please help us. Help us to honor you the way you deserve to be honored. Help us understand what a great privilege it is to be in your presence without being burned up. Help us to see how much we have in Christ so that we don't run to other things for pleasure. God, help our church. Bring back the fascination of worship. Bring back a trembling at your word. Get rid of all the distractions and the other things that our minds are filled with. Oh, God, bring us back to you, Lord. God, do whatever it takes, Lord. Seriously, do whatever it takes to get our attention, God. Back on you, centered on you. You are all that matters. You are so good. We praise you, Jesus. We've come in here to praise you and to experience you. We pray all these things. We pray for your grace to fall on us right now as we read your word. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I just don't want to add too much to what's been spoken about who it is that we worship. Like when we sing, do you picture that God? Like do you, do you imagine that, that, that being who's, who, who's like that, the sun beyond the sun where oh, I can't even get close to him without getting burned up except that? Jesus, I come by the blood of Jesus. You picture, you, you know, the, the angels in heaven worshiping him, you know, and screaming at his holiness. And now you're about to join them in singing to him. Like when you pray and you close your eyes, do you just start saying things? Or do you actually imagine and, and picture him and, and think about who he is before you talk? Because that will change the way you pray. That will change the way you sing. And even right now, like, like I know sometimes we can be in worship and we're thinking about the presence of God and then when it comes time to open his word, we kind of sit back and relax as if this was a passive time where I, it's up to me to do something to you and get something through to you and so you sit back. But you guys, this is... It's got to be like this active listening. You worship by the way you tremble at what his word says. We want us to just be focused on him from beginning to end when we walk in this room. Because remember, like we said last week, we are here to minister to him. And God right now is watching us. And he knows what I feel about his word and how I'm presenting it, how careful I am. He knows how you're listening to his word and how much reverence. I've been praying. I've been praying for this gathering. I've been praying that miracles would happen tonight. Like absolute miracles from God. Now when you think that, you think, okay, well, 
Are people going to get healed? Maybe. Or someone going to have some prophetic word? Maybe. Someone going to be delivered of something? Could be. But what I've been praying for specifically for tonight is the miracle of godly sorrow to fall upon us. Let me explain. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 9. In Ezekiel chapter 9, God is talking about how he's about to destroy Jerusalem. And he's going to judge these people. He's going to execute judgment on them for those who are wicked. And so he's talking to these angels that are going to that are going to destroy. But he says in verse 4, there was, uh, right before it, it says that there was one angel in in verse 3 that that he was clothed in linen with a writing case at his waist. And uh, he called to the one who was clothed in linen, and he says in verse 4, the Lord said to him, pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. And to the others, he said in my hearing, pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the house. This is so intense. This is God saying, okay, I'm, I'm sending my angels and they're going to destroy my holy city. And, and but before, he goes, before you go though, he goes, he sends this one angel. He goes, this is very similar to like the Passover. Remember that? When they, they put the blood over the doorpost and the destroying angel doesn't kill the firstborn in those homes. It's very similar to Revelation when he talks about how he seals 144,000 before this, this, uh, this, this judgment of God. And here he says, okay, before you go judging everyone, you, the one, you know, with the, with the mark, go put a mark on everyone's forehead, but look at who he marks. In verse 4, the Lord said to him, pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. So God is looking at the city and he is disturbed at the sin in that city. And so he says, I'm going to destroy it, but before I destroy it, Hey, mark the people who sigh and groan over the abominations that are going on in the city. He goes, you remember that song we used to sing, Hosanna? And he says, break my heart for what breaks yours. God was looking for the people here. He's telling Ezekiel, look, I'm looking for the people whose hearts are broken. They actually sigh. It's an actual, like a, almost a sigh, like, and, but, but he, they, they sigh and they groan. It's like a, a loud cry. It's like, ah, I can't stand the things that are going on down here because I know how much he hates it. I know how you hate it, God. And I hate it too. And God says, when I see that person, that's the person I'm going to mark. Because they, they have a heart for the things that I have a heart for. And I'm, I was reading this week and going, God, I'm, I don't remember the last time I've wept over sin. Whether it's my sin, or the church's sin, or the sin of the Bay Area, 
I'm going, God, I, I want to be one of these people. I want to be one of these people that you would mark and go, gosh, he is just as sad about this as I am. And what's crazy to me about this passage, I mean, there's a lot that's crazy about it, but he says, okay, go, 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 kill everyone. But he goes, start at the sanctuary. Start at my sanctuary. Start with the elders. Closest to the sanctuary. He, he said, I'm going to destroy the city, but I want to start right there by the temple that those who are supposed to be my leaders. And I'm going, God, this is serious. It's, this is not about us going and judging the world. God will do that. And we should be broken over the sin. But I think an even deeper brokenness should be over his church. You gotta remember, this is about Jerusalem that he's talking. That was supposed to be the city of God. That was supposed to be the city that stood out amongst every other city on the planet. And they're, they're so full of sin and so casual about God. And so God says, Angels go out there and just start slaughtering them all. But start at my sanctuary. Start with those elders that are closest. Guys, this is heavy. I want to turn you to another passage. Oh, well, no. You know what? Let me, uh, let me say a couple more things. Even as Justin was sharing tonight, I was just repenting before God as I've been trying to repent, trying to feel what God wants me to feel. You know, that's why I'm saying I'm praying for that miracle to happen. I'm praying for it to happen in me. When Justin was talking about the holiness of God and how do we just not be consumed by him, I, I just I wonder how many people in our church have that type of reverence for God. And, and then as a leader, as an elder, I'm going, God, I am so sorry because I have not been just vigilant about like making sure every one of you understands what God is like. I've just been a little relaxed about it. And it's got to start at the sanctuary. It's got to start with the leaders. And so I ask your forgiveness because when we come to worship God, we should have such a high reverence for this consuming fire. And I've kind of let that slip. Interesting, when Jesus was starting his ministry, one of the first things he does is what? Go to the temple and cleanse it and says, look, this is my father's house. This was supposed to be a house of prayer. And he had the zeal for his father's house, and he does it again at the end. But I want you to look at another passage. It's, it's Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, he's talking about the day of the Lord. It's like when the day that the Lord visits. And in Joel chapter 2, starting in verse 11, it says, The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome, who can endure it? Exactly what Justin was preaching about. Because the day of the Lord is great and very, the day that God visits, the day that he comes is very great and very awesome. 
Who can endure it? Who can make it through that fire? Verse 12, yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. So what God is saying here, he goes, look, the, the day of the Lord is coming. I know it's not popular to preach about this day of the Lord, this judgment day that's coming, and this all-consuming God. We're here again. He says, who's going who's to stand in that? Who can endure the presence of God coming down? But then he says, but even now, he goes, if you guys will return to me, with all of your heart. But how do they do it? What does he say? He says, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And this is why I prayed for the miracle. I go, God, I, I could call us to fast. But how do you call people to weep and mourn? You can't make someone feel bad about their sin. I'm going, God, the times that I wept. You, okay, because when I look in Scripture, one of, if not the biggest sin in my understanding of Scripture is pride. And I remember when I was younger, I had people confront me on my pride. I remember having one professor who, who looked at me and just says, gosh, everything just seems like a competition to you, like you're trying to preach better than your classmates. I know, believe it or not, I was competitive. And he, he's like, but he goes, I just see a pride in you. And I remember this other youth pastor that just said, man, has anyone ever confronted you on your arrogance? You're just proud. And I, and I defended myself. I'm like, well, it just seems that way. I don't forget what I said. He goes, are you paying attention to what you're doing right now? You're defending your humility. How proud do you have to be to defend your humility? And I remember walking out of his office that day and going, he doesn't know me. He doesn't know how humble I really am. And my, my point is, is you can't confront a proud person on their pride because they're, they're too proud to weep and mourn over their sin. They're too, they can't imagine themselves really being that ab abomination in the eyes of God. People couldn't do it for me. But I remember, I remember sitting in the front row at a conference I was supposed to speak at, and suddenly God just like revealed to me the pride in my heart, and I just started sobbing. I remember just being in the, the front row as, as everyone was singing this hymn. I still remember it was Great is Thy Faithfulness. And there's, there's hundreds, maybe thousands of people, I don't remember. And I'm just sitting there and I'm getting ready to speak and it just hit me. God just showed me, look at yourself. You're so proud of yourself. You're so glad that these people are talking about you. And I'm just sobbing. Like not a little tear here, like ugly cry, snot everywhere. I can't control myself. I am this mourning, weeping. Because God was showing me my pride and showing me how self-centered I was and how I had become all these things that I thought I would never be. And I'm so grateful for the times. This is the thing, you guys. I am so grateful for that time. 
I'm so grateful for the times when I bawled my eyes out because I was struck with just the ugliness in my life. Those are good things. That's a gift from God. I don't want to spend my whole life feeling nothing about my sin against God. I don't want to spend my life just kind of being flippant about sin in the church or the sin in our city. And so I go, God, thank you for breaking me. So I can't make myself cry, mourn, sigh, groan. I can fast. But all that other stuff, that's a gift from God. And that's what I'm praying for tonight. Like the gift of God that we would see our own sin. Later on in that same chapter in verse 17, it says, between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage or approach a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I'm sending you grain, wine, oil, and you'll be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among nations. This, this is what uh, repentance, weeping, sadness leads to. As those, as those priests, you know, broke down and wept over the sin of his followers, God relented and had pity. But it was those priests saying, God, you've got to do this because everyone knows we follow Yahweh God. And so if you just destroy, you know, your city, then they're going to go, see, he's not that powerful. And in the same way, aren't there just times when you go, God, you've got to do something in the church. In the church. Otherwise, they're going to say, oh, who cares about the Christians? You know, it's just like what are the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Muslims, it's all the same. In fact, it's the Christians that are most divided. It's them where all the scandals are happening. And we have to cry, oh God, that just makes us sick. This was the church, this is the bride that you put your spirit in. And yet look at us. We're no different. God, please, you've got to change us for your name's sake. It's, it's just for your glory because we're taking the name of Christ, Christian. Please, does this bother you? Does it bring a sorrow to you? One more passage I want to look at. It's 2 Corinthians. I love this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what earnestness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians. He confronts them on their sin. And he says, what I love is I saw godly sorrow. And he says, godly sorrow leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. He goes, look at what this grieving, look at what this sadness produced in you. It actually made you zealous. It actually made you change. This is a good thing. It leads to salvation. 
this mourning, this weeping. As we prayed about tonight, when a group of us get together and we pray, and we go, God, what are you saying to our church? What do you want us to focus on this Friday night? We felt this very clear. We need to be broken about our sin. We need to be broken about our sin. We need God to actually have us feel something. And, and what I'm realizing is we live in such a fast-paced world with so many distractions that you can get convicted about your sin like you do right now maybe, and then right afterwards go to your phone and, and be in a whole different world and lay down with Netflix and be in a, a whole other world. You don't even have time to think about your sin long enough to actually feel bad about it. You can't concentrate on the broken state of the church long enough to actually weep over it. But the eyes of the Lord are looking. I just want to mark those who are weeping over the sin that understand the day of the Lord is coming. And so they fast and weep and mourn. And God shows pity. And they have a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. But he says the worldly sorrow leads to death. Worldly sorrow is what happens in churches every weekend. It's people feel guilty about something, and then they do nothing. They're like, oh, shoot. But it doesn't lead to repentance. That's the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. That's what he's saying there in 2 Corinthians 10, 7, 7, 10. He says, you know what, here's the difference. There's a, there's a grieving that anyone in the world can feel. But it doesn't lead to change. It doesn't lead to repentance. But godly sorrow leads to repentance. This week at the elder meeting, uh, Sean was bringing up a, a friend of mine who was like a Christian performer type of guy. And, he was just saying he was reading about it because he was so solid. But now he's decided to nearly ditch the faith completely, but he found the most progressive Christian church he could find. And I thought about that. I go, wow, so many people are doing this. And they call it progressive. And the idea behind that is, well, we don't hold on to the same things that people have been holding on to for 6,000 years. We're making progress. We're, we're making progress in our view of sexuality. We're making progress in our view of morality, of what's right. We're not holding on to these same things that people held on to 100 years ago. We're progressing. Does that make you sad? Doesn't it make you sad that for 6,000 years, think about the 6,000 years of human history, people have held on to the truths of this book. It was passed on, passed on, passed on, passed on, until our generation. We're the first generation of church where the church itself is saying, yeah, I think that's okay now. We're not going to talk about marriage being between one man and one woman. Like, we're the first generation to do this. Does that bother you? The 6,000 years from Adam and Eve, it, it's like, a, it's like the, the relay race. You know how the U.S. team always drops the baton. We always have the fastest team and somehow they don't pass it right. And, 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 and to think that, okay, but look, 
Adam. He passed it to Seth. He passed it to whoever was next. He passed it, passed it, passed it. You know, I'll pass it to Moses. I'll pass it to, to Joshua. You know, and I, just going on and on. They have held the line. They pass it. Jesus passes it to Paul. Passes it to everyone for 6,000 years. And now comes Bay Area, 2023. And they pass this morality to us that was passed down from Adam. We go, no, we're progressive. And God's watching and He's watching His people. And he goes, you're going to do that? You're going to be the generation that drops the baton and says, no, because I want to attract people. I want to appeal to people. We've lost our fear of God. We've lost a trembling at His Word. And we're just listening to people. And we're so affected by how they feel and think. And I'm not saying we don't show compassion and love and concern and we say all things with love. But I am saying, like I said last week, the church was the pillar of truth the buttress. We were the ones that were supposed to hold the line. And I'm holding it till I die. I'm going to hold that. And there have been moments when I'd get a little influence here, here, there. But man, God has just made me just so focused right now. No, you say what I tell you to say. And you weep over the sins of the church of your city, of this nation that's held the line until now. I want to weep over that. You know, in in the 80s, I think I might be the only one that remembers the 80s. It's a good season, good music. But uh, in the 80s is when I became a believer and there was a lie back then. They would talk about how the Old Testament God was this God of wrath and holiness. And then we progressed in the New Testament to forgiveness and gentleness and grace. Like it was God changing from a wrathful God to a God of grace. And I just kind of bought into that. So we just studied the New Testament because we're in a new world now. But you guys, anyone who reads the Old Testament and doesn't see the grace of God all through the Old Testament, I've got a question whether you really read it. And anyone who reads the New Testament and reads the book of Revelation and believes there's no wrath coming, I, I've really got to question your reading skills. You read Revelation and go, oh, so nice. Yeah, it's all, it's, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then uh, in the early 2000s, that's when people began to really question the day of the Lord. Did God really say He was going to come back and judge people? Really? You think a loving God would pour out his wrath upon people? And we stop talking about the day of the Lord, judgment. They used to talk about that when I was a kid. They used to talk about that when I was in high school. And I'd start telling all my friends in my public high school about Jesus because I was so concerned about the day of the Lord. But then our generation was the one that, just like we got rid of sexual sin, we got rid of hell, we got rid of fearing the Lord. And I'm just saying, I want to be broken over this to where I do something about it, speak openly about it, weep about it, fast over it. Because we 
we're ditching God's word and calling it progressive. Because the truth is, is there is a progressiveness in Scripture. But it's not to deviate from holiness. It's quite the opposite. What did Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount? Well, I know you heard it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say to you, it's not a big deal anymore. No, he goes, what I say to you, don't even look at a woman lustfully. You even look lustfully and it's adultery. He goes, I know it, it says, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I'm saying, no, you, you've got to love your enemies. I know you heard it was said, do not commit murder. But I'm saying, don't even hate your brother. If you hate your brother, that's murder. If you call him a fool, you're guilty of the fires of hell. I mean, does, does that look like he was easing off on restrictions? Man, and when you read the whole book of Hebrews, it's all about, yes, God was terrifying then, but you should understand what we have now. He goes, because more has been revealed to us. And he goes, yeah, he flooded the earth and killed everyone, but guess what? He shook the earth once, but there's coming a day when he's going to shake the heavens and the earth. And he goes, your God is a consuming fire, so you better worship him with reverence and awe. This is not about progressing to a casual, oh, we're not like Old Testament anymore where they had to be careful going into the temple and going to the Holy of Holies. No, the Bible actually says, no, you should have more reverence because those were human beings that warned them in the Old Testament. Now you have the Son of God warning people from heaven is what the book of Hebrews says. So there should be I want us to be a progressive church. But pro progressive as the Bible talks about it. Amen. Thank you. Hold the line. <laughs> you guys, I don't know how much time we have left, you know, on this earth. It sure does not seem like it's going to be long before the day of the Lord. And I'll share all my thoughts on that someday. But it's just too much in Scripture pointing to this. And my concern is when he comes back, will he find us grieving, sighing, groaning, fasting, weeping, mourning, over the things that break his heart. And so I, I want to give us some time right now. We always have to start with ourselves. Us as believers. Like I shared, I remember times when I felt so horrible about my sin. And I just wept like a baby. And I'm asking God, take the pride, the callousness, whatever it is in me, the ADD, the distracted nature. Open my eyes to my own sin, to where I grieve over it, the sin of the church the apathy in the church to where I weep over it, the immorality in the city to where I weep over it, because these were your creation. You made them to know you and to follow you and to follow your commands that lead to life. And let's spend some time in prayer, in worship, The Lord leads you. Maybe you want to come up to the altar at some point and just weep. 
groan, sigh before the Lord? If you feel like you need prayer, grab one of the elders or one of the, one of the women leaders and just ask for prayer. Let me pray for us. God, please, would your spirit fall on us right now? Help us to weep over the garbage in our lives, the garbage in the church, just the sin that we live in. Help us to believe in the day of the Lord and tremble for ourselves, for our families, for our friends. God, help us not be the generation that drops it, that drops the baton of truth. We are so sorry, God, for forgetting that you are a consuming fire to where we spend most days more concerned about what people think. Please, Lord, restore your bride. Fall upon us in this room. bao đêm đợi chờ mưa rơi lòng cháy với như xưa biển khơi cánh chim bể nhau tung bay người đầu hay ta không oan trời bao năm tình yêu chưa phai giờ chia hai đôi lứa lạc nhau nỗi gió số phận đã không an bài bền lâu người đi về đâu rồi Đừng